Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you uh, to our um, annual uh, Rice Passive uh, Lecture. This is an important uh, event for us. Uh, my name is Marcus Cole. If you don't know me, I'm the Dean of Notre Dame Law School. And the Rice Hassan Lecture is one of the most important events that we have here uh, at Notre Dame, uh, actually honoring uh, three different people. Um, it honors uh, the late uh, Professor Charlie Rice, who was a longtime member of this faculty uh, and a leader with regard to Catholic uh, intellectual thought in the law. It also uh, recognizes uh, his daughter, uh, Mary Rice Hassan, and her husband, uh, 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 Seamus Hassan, um, both of whom have been instrumental in the fight for uh, religious freedom. And in fact, our Religious Liberty Initiative is based upon Seamus Hassan's book, uh, The Right to Be Wrong. Um, and everything that we uh, do uh, is, uh, is guided in part by the wisdom that he shares with us uh, in, that, in that book. And so we are honored that the, the Notre Dame uh, program on church, state, and society, which is headed up by Professor Rick Garnett, has been able to, to invite uh, President uh, Garvey here to, to deliver the Rice Hassan Lecture. And uh, we hope to make this a longstanding tradition here. But before um, uh, Professor Garnett introduces uh, 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 President Garvey. I want to uh, acknowledge the presence of uh, Justice uh, Leona Theron of the uh, Constitutional Court of South Africa. Who is so with that, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Garnett to introduce President Garvey. Uh, thanks, Dean Cole. I, I know nobody comes to these things to hear uh, introductions, so I, I'm going to tell you in advance that my introduction will not even possibly do justice uh, to President John Garvey's uh, career and contributions. Uh, President Garvey has a couple of cool titles. So he's Professor Emeritus. That's a nice Latin word, right? But it gets even better. Uh, when he was president of, as he likes to call it, the Catholic University of America, uh, <laughs> He had the title Rector Magnificus. And I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, and I was a kid once, I was like, I was in a heavy metal band, and I wish I'd known that name. <laughs> because I, I would have called the band Rector Magnificus. Um, but John Garvey has been an inspiration to many of us here at Notre Dame Law School. Uh, so much of, the, of what's happened here at Notre Dame is a, is a product of his vision and initiative and work. Um, for better or worse, you can blame him if you want, but he's the reason I'm a professor at Notre Dame Law School. Uh, he, uh, after a distinguished career here, he went on to be the dean at um, someplace in Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts, and then, again, became the president of the Catholic University of America. He is one of the leading scholars in the world on questions of uh, law and religion, and particularly of questions that go to the heart of the program on church, state, and society, which namely questions about the role and the rights of religious institutions and communities and associations. And he's been a powerful voice in American higher education for the importance of institutional pluralism and of uh, the contributions that religious institutions make to that pluralism. So please join me in welcoming uh, my friend, President Harvey, to the right House. Thank you, Rick. I, uh, it's actually cool what Rick said. I, uh, so so um, it's because Catholic University is an ecclesiastical university that the, that the president is the rector and the Latin title is the rector magnificus, but the English version of that is you're magnificent. So I, I, I tried to get my kids to call me that, but it didn't, it didn't work. Um, it's really nice to be back here. I spent four happy years on this campus as, a, as an undergraduate. Um, I later spent five equally happy years at the law school where I had the pleasure of working with Charlie Rice, uh, for whom this lecture is named. And Charlie and his wife, Mary, had 10 children um, whom we held up as examples to our own slightly younger and less well-behaved um, offspring. Their, uh, their son, John, was our pediatrician. 
the youngest, Patty, uh, whom the kids called Bryce. Patty uh, was a <laughs> classmate of our oldest at St. Joe and at Notre Dame. Um, daughter Mary, named for her mom, is a graduate of this school and a fellow of the Ethics and Public Policy Center. And for the past 13 years, I have heard and heeded her advice about parents' rights and gender ideology and religious freedom. Mary's husband, Seamus, also a graduate of the University of Notre Dame, is the founder of the Beckett Fund, which is the nation's foremost defender of religious freedom. And for the past decade, I've had the honor of serving his organization as secretary and a board member. So speaking to you allows me to honor three people I've known and admired for many years. So thank you for asking me to do this. Um, when I was more active in the real work of the academy, my field of study was public law. And my particular interest was constitutional rights, especially freedoms like speech and religion. As a university president for the past 12 years, I have been, if anything, more attentive to those issues. Um, but my focus, natural enough, given my position, <clears throat> has been on the intellectual and religious culture of institutions rather than the rights of individuals. And uh, this gives me a chance today to talk about the role of freedom in building Catholic institutions, in particular universities. I'm particularly interested in a metaphor that the First Amendment crowd uses to talk about um, this sort of thing, the marketplace of ideas. And for those of you who will nod off during my talk, let me uh, summarize my conclusions up front. Um, first of all, if you want to build a great Catholic university, hire the right people. Second, don't tell them what to say. That's my uh, speech in a nutshell. Let me... Um, begin by saying a few things about the marketplace of ideas. We can credit Oliver Wendell Holmes with um, the marketplace metaphor. During the First World War, the United States prosecuted a handful of Russian anarchists for publishing leaflets arguing that the war would derail the Bolshevik Revolution and that people working in the munitions factories should, for that reason, go on strike. Um, the Supreme Court upheld their conviction in a case called Abrams against the United States and Justice Holmes dissented. He argued in words that the court would later adopt as law that um, incitement shouldn't be punished unless it presented a clear and present danger of causing the harm that the government was worried about. Uh, and he said, nobody can suppose that the surreptitious publishing of a silly leaflet by an unknown man without more would present any immediate danger that its opinions would hinder the success of the government's arms. He went on to explain why he thought that the First Amendment required this degree of tolerance, and here's the punchline. <clears throat> he said, persecution for the expression of opinions seems to me perfectly logical. If you have no doubt of your premises or your power and want a certain result with all your heart, you naturally express your wishes in law and sweep away all opposition. But when men have realized that time has upset many fighting faiths, they may come to believe, even more than they believe the very foundations of their own conduct, that the ultimate good desired is better reached by free trade in ideas, that the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market. And the truth is the only ground upon which their wishes safely can be carried out. That, at any rate, is the theory of our Constitution, he said. <clears throat> Half a century later, when I was a boy, um, Holmes's metaphor had won wide favor. America was still worried about communists, but the court gave them more room to operate. In 1967, um, Keishian against the Board of Regents struck down a New York law that required state employees to swear that they weren't communists. <clears throat> Harry Keishian was an English teacher at the University of Buffalo. A, a, a private school at the time, and he became a state employee when Buffalo merged into the SUNY system. And his contract was not renewed because he refused to sign the required certificate. Justice Brennan held that New York couldn't forbid simple membership in the Communist Party without evidence of some more specific and nefarious intent. Here's what he said. Our nation is deeply committed to safeguarding academic freedom which is of transcendent value to all of us, and not merely to the teacher's concern. That freedom is therefore a special concern of the First Amendment, which does not tolerate laws that cast a pall of orthodoxy over the classroom. The classroom is 
peculiarly the marketplace of ideas. The nation's future depends upon leaders trained through wide exposure to that robust exchange of ideas which discovers truth out of a multitude of tongues rather than through any kind of authoritative selection. So this marketplace of ideas is a metaphor. It, it says something true by saying something false, like, like um, the soft what light through yonder window breaks, it is the east and Juliet is the sun. Um, and though the court speaks about free trade and a speech market, people don't actually buy and sell ideas. In a real market, people use price signals to coordinate their actions and create efficiency through trade. But Abrams was giving out his pamphlets for free, and Kayishian wanted New York to pay him for spreading ideas that New York didn't want to buy. So we have to be careful about insisting on too specific an interpretation of the figure of speech. The metaphor does, though, cleverly express a vision of the First Amendment. It says that the government should refrain from interfering in the marketplace of ideas the way the Chicago School says the government should refrain from interfering in the market for goods. The United States should let Abrams distribute his pamphlets. New York should let Kayishian hold and teach his unorthodox views. And the reason for this laissez-faire approach is that just as the free trade in good results in public benefits, efficient production, consumer satisfaction, so too will freedom of speech. Truth will emerge from the competition of the market rather than through any kind of authoritative selection. Or so Justice Holmes says. Whether that really happens seems like an empirical proposition to me. It might or it might not. We can test the results through experience. I'd like to return to this point in a moment. It's an important one. But for Justice Holmes, though, the assertion about truth winning out in the marketplace was actually a tautology rather than an empirical proposition. The year before he wrote this dissent in Abrams, he wrote an article for the Harvard Law Review about natural law. And in this, he disputed the idea that there were objective or universal truths. Truth, he said, was just what people agreed on. So what prevailed in the marketplace was ipso facto true. Here's how he put it. I used to say, Holmes writes, when I was young, the truth was the majority vote of that nation that could lick all others. Our test of truth is a reference to either a present or an imagined future majority in favor of our view. The jurists who are in favor of natural law seem to me to be in that naive state of mind that accepts what has been familiar and accepted by them and their neighbors as something that must be accepted by all men everywhere. This doesn't undermine the argument for a free market of ideas. If anything, it makes it stronger and more like an economic market. The market is a good me mechanism for maximizing the intellectual satisfaction of consumers of ideas. Holmes's claim about truth prevailing in the marketplace has a familiar ring about it, though, even for people who don't share his commitment to legal realism. The best known early defense of free speech in the English speaking world, Areopagitica, was written by John Milton during the English Civil War. Parliament had in 1643 passed a law requiring authors to secure a government license before they could publish their works. And here is what Milton wrote in opposition to the law. This is a passage familiar to you all. Though all the winds of doctrine were let loose to play upon the earth, so truth be in the field we do injuriously by licensing and prohibiting to misdoubt her strength. Let her and falsehood grapple, whoever knew truth put to the worse in a free and open encounter. The truth that Milton had in mind was theological rather than political or scientific. And the reason for his confidence was not that truth is by definition the result of a majority vote, but rather that God has his eye on the exchange as he does on the sparrow's flight. Here is Milton again. For when God shakes a kingdom with strong and healthful commotions to a general reforming, tis not untrue that many sectarians and false teachers are then busiest in seducing. 
But yet more true it is that God then raises to his own work, it's my grandchild, so you'll have to forgive me. <laughs> that God then raises to his own work men of rare abilities and more than common industry, not only to look back and revise what hath been taught heretofore, but to gain further and go on some new enlightened steps in the discovery of truth. For such is the order of God's enlightening his church, to dispense and deal out by degrees his beam, so as our earthly eyes may best sustain it. Catholics share with Puritans like Milton the belief that God has his eye on the church and preserves her in the truth of her essential doctrines. I wouldn't describe the mechanism we rely on as a free market because it is heavily regulated by the bishops and the Pope. <laughs> but the Second Vatican Council declared in Dignitatis Humanae that each of us, by virtue of our human dignity, should be free to seek religious truth with the aid of communication and dialogue, in the course of which men explain to one another the truth they have discovered or think they have discovered, in order thus to assist one another in the quest for truth. The church doesn't guarantee us all success in that quest. Faith, after all, is a gift. But the church makes a further point about why the government and others should refrain from coercing shoppers in the marketplace of religious ideas. Here's what Vatican II says. It is one of the major tenets of Catholic doctrine that man's response to God in faith must be free. No one, therefore, is to be forced to embrace the Christian faith against his will. The act of faith is of its very nature a free act. God has regard for the dignity of the human person whom he himself created, and man is to be guided by his own judgment, and he is to enjoy freedom. In short, a space for free inquiry, whether we call it a market or not, is important because only a free embrace of truth is religiously efficacious. Okay, so I said I wanted to talk about two things, and I've just been setting the table. This is uh, um, what we have to say, what people think about the marketplace of ideas. I now want to talk about the first of the two points I want to uh, discuss, and this is really about faculty hiring. So this metaphor is the prevailing way of explaining why the First Amendment protects freedom of speech, that an unregulated market is the best way to get at the truth. As many of you know, the First Amendment um, only applies to the government. The First Amendment says Congress shall make no law uh, abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. What about other actors in the marketplace of ideas? I mean, what about universities? Um, for example, over the past few years, we have seen Facebook and Twitter controlling who can speak, think Donald Trump, and what they can say, think about COVID. Whether their interference in the market should be subject to the same rules as the government's interference is an interesting question. We actually have a law that's designed to encourage a kind of laissez-faire attitude among internet platforms. This is section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which the Supreme Court is looking at this term in Gonzales against Google. Anyway, because of my job, I have been interested not so much in government regulation of speech as in the management of speech at private universities. For us, the question arises in two different contexts, and as I said, I'd like to begin with the single most important activity in institution building, faculty hiring. Harry Kayishian worked for a private school until soon he acquired the University of Buffalo in 1962, and the question in his case was whether somebody who believed the things that he believed could hold a job at the university. And let me remind you, here again is what Justice Brennan had to say about that. The nation's future depends upon leaders trained through wide exposure to that robust exchange of ideas, which discovers truth out of a multitude of tongues, rather than through any kind of authoritative selection. So if we're interested in the discovery of truth, why should it matter whether the university is public or private? Let me put it more plainly. Universities are all about discovering truth and goodness and beauty. The metaphor suggests that the best way to go about that is to hire people with all different kinds of ideas and points of view. And this presents a problem for Catholic universities like yours and mine. Two of our last three popes have been university professors. And one of them, St. John Paul II, addressed the issue of faculty hiring 
in his apostolic constitution, Ex Corde Ecclesiae, and here is the most important direction in that document. Those university teachers and other administrators who belong to other churches, as well as those who profess no belief, and also all students, are to recognize and respect the distinctive Catholic identity of the university. In order not to endanger the Catholic identity of the university, the number of non-Catholic teachers should not be allowed to constitute a majority within the institution, which is and must remain Catholic. And recognizing that there are differences around the world in the situation of Catholic universities, Ex Corde Ecclesiae says that the norms it lays down are to be applied concretely at the local level by Episcopal conferences. In our country, that means today the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. And it took a decade for the USCCB, then the National Conference of Catholic Bishops, to implement this direction in a document called the Application of Ex Corde Ecclesiae for the United States. I was teaching at Notre Dame at the time, and the drafts that the bishops put forward were really controversial uh, within the academic community. I would say that most of the fuss was focused on a requirement for theologians. Section four of the particular norms in Ex Corde specifies this, Catholics who teach the theological disciplines in a Catholic university are required to have a mandatum granted by competent ecclesiastical authority. That means that theologians should go to the local bishop to get approval of their work. They weren't keen on that. But as I've often said to the bishops, the most important um, phrase in Ex Corde Ecclesiae is not that requirement of the mandatum. It's rather the direction that the application gives about faculty hiring. Remember, it says, in accordance with, well, in accordance with its procedures for the hiring and retention of professionally qualified faculty, the university should strive to recruit and appoint Catholics as professors so that, to the extent possible, those committed to the witness of the faith will constitute a majority of the faculty. All professors are expected to be aware of and committed to the Catholic mission and identity of their institution. Notice two things. In addition to the obvious requirement that Catholics comprise a majority of the faculty, the application doesn't just say uh, that faculty should present a baptismal certificate, a sort of green card for getting a job at the university. It speaks of Catholics committed to the witness of the faith. That's actually a term of art. In a document called Disciples Called to Witness, the USCCB Committee on Evangelization and Catechesis observes that the church is being challenged by an abandonment of the faith, a phenomenon progressively more manifest in societies and cultures which for centuries seem to be permeated by the gospel. In this context, it says, being a witness of the faith means to evangelize by entering into dialogue with modern culture and confronting the cultural crisis brought on by secularization. The second thing to notice is what the application asks of non-Catholics. It's not enough that they be aware of their employer's Catholic mission. They should also be, the document says, committed to the Catholic mission and identity of their institution. <coughs> so if the marketplace of ideas is meant to suggest a kind of intellectual bazaar where all kinds of ideas, points of view, and scholarly agendas can open up stalls and compete for the attention of scholastic shoppers. This seems like a different vision. That in turn implies that Catholic universities are not committed to the pursuit of truth, at least as our First Amendment theory understands it. And that is in fact how many in the academy understand the issue. The self appointed steward of the professoriate, the American Association of University Professors, conceives of academic freedom as a bundle of rights that belong to faculty members and them alone. In its 1940 statement of principles on academic freedom and tenure, the AAUP says that academic freedom has three aspects, the teacher's freedom in research and publication, in classroom discussion, and in speaking as a citizen. The statement adds this, Limitations of academic freedom because of religious or other aims of the institution should be clearly stated in writing at the time of the appointment. 30 years later, Committee A, the AUP Committee on Academic and Freedom and Tenure, added this interpretive comment. It said, most church-related institutions 
no longer need or desire the departure from the principle of academic freedom implied in the 1940 statement, and we do not now endorse such a departure. In short, according to the AAUP, a university worthy of the name will appoint and promote teachers without regard to their religious commitments, insisting that faculty subscribe to a particular orthodoxy is a departure from the principles of academic freedom. It's not enough that prospective employees are made aware of such an expectation at the time they're hired, a sort of truth in advertising requirement. Even if all members of the community are willing participants, it would not be the sort of university the AAUP would endorse. As one of Committee A's subcommittees put it in 1988, schools that would invoke the 1940 exception forfeit the moral right to proclaim themselves as authentic seats of higher learning. It's pretty harsh. Uh, not to say counterproductive. Suppose that we were able to rigorously enforce the AAUP's vision that each university build a faculty constructed randomly without regard to their religious, philosophical, or ideological commitments. This increases diversity within each faculty, but it eliminates diversity among faculties. Every faculty would tend to resemble every other faculty. Bye. I'll send you the notes. Every faculty would tend to resemble every other faculty, uh, except for statistical deviations from the mean. It makes the academic marketplace look like a case of M&M pouches. There's variety within each bag, but every bag is like every other bag. It makes you want some Sour Patch Kids. And here's the funny thing. If you look at the really successful intellectual movements that have emerged from universities over the past century, you will find an approach to institution building that resembles the vision of ex corde ecclesiae. Consider the University of Chicago's economics faculty. 33 members of that faculty or alumni of that school have won Nobel Prizes, including Douglas Diamond last year. The influence of the economists over the years has radiated outward. In my own discipline, law and economics has had a great influence on antitrust and tort law. Richard Posner and Frank Easterbrook taught at the University of Chicago. Robert Bork went to law school there. Public choice theory has imported economic tools to deal with the problems of political science. <clears throat> James Buchanan, a student of Frank Knight, won the Nobel Prize in 1986 for his pioneering work in the field. Chicago's economics faculty, as we think of it, began in the 1930s and 40s under the leadership of Frank Knight, the teacher of Buchanan and of Milton Friedman and George Stigler, and a major influence on Ronald Coase. Knight hired people who thought the way he did. He was skeptical about the reliability of economic principles, he was opposed to government interference in the market, and he was in favor of prices rather than social engineering as a way to manage production and distribution. Under Knight's direction, and later the intellectual leadership of Milton Friedman, Chicago was the very embodiment of free market thinking. Ronald Coase once observed the essential similarity between the school's approach to economic theory and the standard approach to the First Amendment. Here's what Coase said. I do not believe that this distinction between the market for goods and the market for ideas is valid. There is no fundamental difference between these two markets. And in deciding on public policy with regard to them, we need to take into account the same considerations. We will not be able to form a judgment in which we can have any confidence unless we abandon the present ambivalence about the performance of government in the two markets and adopt a more consistent view. We have to decide whether the government is as incompetent as is generally assumed in the market for ideas, or whether it's as efficient as it is generally assumed to be in the market for goods. But here's the thing. Despite its laissez-faire attitude, the university did not seek a multitude of tongues for its faculty. Paul Douglas was Knight's colleague in the 20s and 30s, and when he returned to the department after serving in World War II, he found it had changed. The economic and political conservatives had acquired an almost complete dominance over my department, he said. 
and taught that market decisions were always right and profit values the supreme ones. Knight was openly hostile to me, and his disciples seemed to be everywhere. Douglas, a, a Democrat, uh, left the school, ran for the Senate, where he served for 18 years, and, and then he returned to teaching at the new school in New York City. Here's another example. When I was in college here in the late 1960s, the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory was all the rage. Everybody, everybody but me, um, read Herbert Marcuse's Eros and Civilization, One Dimensional Man, A Critique of Pure Tolerance. Everybody but me read Eric Fromm's The Art of Loving. I spent the better part of my sophomore year trying to figure out what was meant by the word dialectical, which was cropping up everywhere. Students then used the word dialectical the way students today use the word like. <laughs> it could be any part of a speech or of a sentence. <laughs> Angela Davis uh, was then teaching at UCLA, uh, was a member of the Black Panthers and a student of Marcusa, the, the father of the new left. Summer I graduated from college, there was an armed takeover of the Superior Court in Marin County. The judge and three others were killed. Davis had bought several of the firearms used in the attack, though she was eventually acquitted. The Frankfurt School was known for its critiques of capitalism and Western civilization. When I was in law school, it was the inspiration for the critical legal studies movement. More recently, we've seen its influence in critical race theory and in queer theory. It has inspired French post-structuralism and outside the academy, the Black Lives Matter movement. It's one of the most important intellectual movements of the 20th century, and it was begun on purpose. The Institute for Social Research was founded at the Goethe University Frankfurt in 1923. And he, as Stuart Jeffries puts it in uh, Grand Hotel Abyss, the school came into being in part to try to understand failure in particular, the failure of the German Revolution of 1919. As it evolved during the 1930s, it married neo-Marxist social analysis, whence the fondness for the word dialectical, to Freudian psychoanalytical theories to try to understand why German workers, instead of freeing themselves from capitalism by means of social revolution, as the Russians did, were seduced by modern consumer capitalist society and fatefully Nazism. Max Horkheimer became the director in 1930 and recruited Theodore Adorno, Herbert Marcuse, and Eric Fromm. Horkheimer also involved Walter Benjamin and supported his work with funds from the Institute. Adorno directed the doctoral dissertation of Jürgen Habermas. All the central characters in the school's first generation were Jewish, ethnically if not religiously. And when Hitler became chancellor of the Institute um, in the 30s, decamped to uh, from Germany and officially joined Columbia University in 1935. The faculty that Horkheimer attracted to the Institute had similar backgrounds and interests and ideological inclinations. They were all engaged in the same intellectual project. They would have had no more interest in hiring Friedrich Hayek or Ludwig von Mises than the Chicago School had in keeping Paul Douglas. Let me just give one more example, which also has its origin in Weimar, Germany. The Bauhaus was a German art school founded by Walter Gropius in 1919. It was interested in architecture primarily, but also in art, graphic design, interior design, and even typography. In addition to Gropius, it was led by Hannes Meyer and Mies van der Rohe. The staff included artists like Paul Klee and Vasily Kandinsky. In the early 30s, this school, like the Frankfurt School, came under attack from the Nazis, who saw it as a proponent of degenerate art. And so Walter Gropius and Marcel Breuer left Germany for the US, where they took positions at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. The students there included Philip Johnson and Ian Pei. Mies went to Chicago and headed the architectural school at what is now the Illinois Institute of Technology. And I'm sure you're familiar with their work, even if you don't know it. Mies designed the Lakeshore Drive apartments in Chicago um, and the IBM building in Chicago. He and Philip Johnson did the Seagram building in New York. Walter Gropius did the MetLife building over Grand Central Station in New York City. And also the Harvard Graduate Center, the Harkness Commons and Story Hall and Holmes Hall, where I lived and ate when I was in law school. Um, 
these guys um, had a particular architectural style. They didn't invent the phrase form follows function, but it aptly describes their aesthetic. There is little ornamentation. There's lots of straight lines and right angles, although they like, um, like the Apple guys were in favor of rounded corners rather than uh, right angles. Um, you can see the same thing in their typography. They favored sans serif letters and no capitalization, which in German is kind of funky because the Germans capitalized their nouns. Um, their colors were black and white or primary colors. You don't see a lot of historical acknowledgement or reference. Their ideas are abstract. And they used modern materials, steel and concrete and glass, to make their buildings. The Bauhaus would have had no more interest in hiring Andrea Palladio or Gian Lorenzo Bernini than the Frankfurt School would have had in Hayek or the Chicago School in Paul Douglas. So how should we explain the academic success of schools that focus their hiring on a particular intellectual project? This seems inconsistent with the notion that the free trade in the marketplace of ideas is the surest path to truth. I said earlier that we might best understand that notion as an empirical proposition. It may be so, but it also may not. We could try it out on a bunch of cases and see, and you've just seen what appear to be three fairly persuasive counterexamples. So maybe, if we're good and honest empiricists, we should abandon the metaphor. That's one possibility. Here's another, which I like better, that actually takes the metaphor more seriously. Consider how it is in the market for goods. The fundamental goal of antitrust law is to protect consumers against firm behavior that reduces competition in the marketplace. Section one of the Sherman Act, for example, forbids any contract combination or conspiracy in restraint of trade. For example, an agreement among the companies that make toothpaste to fix the price at a super competitive <coughs> level. This is bad for consumers of toothpaste who have to pay more for the product than they would if producers were competing on price. Or to take another example, suppose that the companies divide up the country into territories and give each participant the exclusive right to sell toothpaste in the assigned area. The control that this agreement gives to each conspirator within its territories would allow it to, allow it to charge monopoly prices, once again, to the detriment of the toothbrushing public. But suppose that um, John Mueller, the CEO of Procter & Gamble, calls a meeting of his executive committee, the vice presidents for sales and finance and manufacturing and marketing, the general counsel and so on. And at the meeting, they agree to set the price of Crest 3D professional ultra bright toothpaste <laughs> at $7.39 for a three ounce tube. That's not a Sherman Act violation the Supreme Court says, because Procter & Gamble is a single entity. And the agreement of the executive committee is not the sort of anti-competitive behavior the law is worried about. Here's what the court says. The officers of a single firm are not separate economic actors pursuing separate economic interests, so agreements among them do not suddenly bring together economic power that was previ previously pursuing divergent goals. Coordination within a firm is as likely to result from an effort to compete as from an effort to stifle competition. In the marketplace, such coordination may be necessary if a business enterprise is to compete effectively. For these reasons, officers or employees of the same firm do not provide the plurality of actors imperative for a Section 1 conspiracy. Perhaps a university is like Procter & Gamble, and there should be a single entity doctrine in the marketplace of ideas as there is in the marketplace for goods. I maintain that there should be, that the proper understanding of academic free trade sees institutions and not individuals as the salient actors. And there's reason to think that this way of understanding the marketplace is consistent with the hypothesis that free trade and ideas is the surest path for truth as the coordination of numerous actors is necessary for an effective business enterprise, so it may also be with academic performance. I've already described three schools of thought whose success derived in part from choosing faculty who saw the world in a particular way. Why should this happen? In the case of what we call a school of thought, 
it surely has something to do with the influence the members of the school have on one another. We can see how this might be effective. Um, remember what Aristotle says about deliberating groups in the politics. He says, when all come together, they may surpass collectively and as a body, although not individually, the quality of the few best. When there are many who contribute to the process of deliberation, each can bring his share of goodness and moral prudence. Some appreciate one part, some another, and all together appreciate all. Aristotle talks about bringing to the discussion different shares of goodness and moral prudence. That's not all. Different members of the group also bring different stores of information and different paths of thought. Think about parallel processing on a computer. Aristotle was describing the way a political body might go about deciding a particular issue entrusted to it for resolution. But the work of a university is more varied and distributed than that. How might faculty members in a law school, for example, teaching antitrust and family law and torts and intellectual property, contribute to one another's work? What might coordination among them look like? Here's a thought experiment that helps draw a picture. Uh, one of my intellectual heroes, Michael Polanyi, a Hungarian chemist, was a pretty famous scientist, but he's better known for his writings about epistemology and social science. In 1962, he gave a lecture at Chicago's Roosevelt University entitled The Republic of Science, about government regulation of the market for scientific ideas. During and after World War II, there were efforts in England to direct the progress of science at universities in the channels that would better serve the public welfare. Polanyi condemned this and compared them to Soviet schemes for having their academy of science guide research the better to support that country's five-year plans. You may be familiar, the scientists among you, with a well-known instance of this. Trofim Lysenko, a Soviet biologist, worked during the Depression at improving wheat crop yields. And Lysenko saw the developing science of genetics as a product of bourgeois capitalism. He believed, contrary to what geneticists were learning, that acquired traits could be passed down to one's offspring. If this were true, it would allow fairly rapid re-engineering of plant and animal life, so the theory naturally appealed to the Soviet leadership. Lysenko became a protege of Stalin's, and his theory about the inheritability of acquired traits became official doctrine. Scientists who disagreed with him were sent to the gulag. Several of them were executed. And the result was the essential destruction of a branch of science in the Soviet Union for several decades. Polanyi said that he appreciated the sentiments that inspired the Brits and, and the Soviet uh, efforts, but he found that their aim was misguided. Science, he said, is a particular kind of joint task that requires the spontaneous coordination of independent initiatives, not central control. Imagine, he says, that we have a very large jigsaw puzzle, and we're trying to put the pieces together in the shortest possible time. We can speed things up by hiring more helpers. But he says, notice how this is different from hiring a dozen people to shell peas. There, each worker can tend to his own pile. The total number of peas shelled won't vary if the workers are isolated from one another. With the jigsaw puzzle, the helpers must work inside of each other so that each time one fits a piece in, the others can see what further steps are possible. This is what we mean by saying that their work is coordinated. But it is also independent. If we try to organize the helper's behavior under a single authority, we lose the benefit of their individual initiatives and we reduce their joint effectiveness to that of a single person directing them from the center. This is what happened with Lysenko. This is an interesting analogy for the work of the university, which Polanyi was trying to protect against government supervision. But notice three things about it. First, it is implicit in the jigsaw puzzle analogy that there is a correct solution. The pieces don't fit together any which way. There is one right arrangement. So unlike uh, Wendell Holmes, Polanyi did not subscribe to epistemological and moral relativism, he believed the truth was real. 
But how do we know when we found it? Who's to say? That's the second interesting thing. If truth is real, there are right and wrong opinions and orthodoxy of science, as Polanyi puts it. And if there is an orthodoxy, there is an authority to judge about it. It can't be any single person. That was the lesson of Lysenko. Rather, it's to be found in the scientific community, which is responsible for maintaining professional standards. But which scientists is competent to judge only about his own small corner of studies, we usually have some sense about standards in immediately adjacent areas. And if we consider the larger community of scientists, we'll find a network of overlapping competencies that together generate uniform standards of scientific merit. Consider again the helpers working on the jigsaw puzzle. It wouldn't work if each person had a different understanding of the job. If, for example, one person believed that the pieces ought to be stacked on top of one another rather than interlocked. The community of scholars has to share the same idea of what problem they're working on and what counts as a good solution. And this is the third point. For the community of scholars to be authoritative, there must be standards for admission to it. In Polanyi's view, the authority of science is essentially traditional. It's transmitted from one generation to another, the way artistic and moral and legal traditions are transmitted. Scientists learn their trade by apprenticing with people who have already mastered the tradition. To be accepted into the trade, they must submit to a vast range of value judgments exercised over all the domains of science. You see where I'm going with this analogy. The faculty at a Catholic university work at widely distributed parts of a very large jigsaw puzzle. It's nevertheless true that advances made by one of them will make possible moves by people in immediately adjacent areas. I think about my own um, intellectual growing up uh, at the University of Kentucky. It's not a Catholic school. I like to say that it was a Baptist school. But I think about how important Patricia Smith was in the philosophy department for my own work. Pat advised me about action theory and she helped me to separate issues of free will from my own preoccupation with freedom as a right. It was important that we worked in sight of one another. Our work was in that sense coordinated. It was also important that we had the same idea of what problem we were working on and what counted as a good solution. Pat was a student of Joel Feinberg, a moral philosopher whose work I liked. And she had a law degree as well as a degree in philosophy. So we spoke the same language. I was involved in hiring her into UK's philosophy department. And my favorable opinions of her were certainly tinged by self-interest. The AAUP disdains the idea that religious orthodoxy should have a role in the selection of university faculty. But notice Polanyi's observation that there is an orthodoxy of science, that the community of scholars has authority to make judgments about what is orthodox, and that the authority of science is essentially traditional. Insisting that faculty at a Catholic university be apprenticed in the orthodox traditions of the faith does not hinder their participation in the school's intellectual projects. On the contrary, it's an essential condition for the making useful contributions. Okay, I said I wanted to talk about two things, and I have been talking about who we hire and how we go about that. I now want to say a few words, a few words, um, about uh, controlling the speech of faculty once they're hired. Is there a place for the enforcement of orthodoxy in the affairs of faculty once they've joined the community? I would like to distinguish among three different sources of authority in the regulation of faculty speech. Let me begin with one which everyone concedes may punish faculty for unorthodox speech. I refer, of course, to the faculty itself. They have the most weighty influence over promotion and tenure. At Notre Dame, there's a committee, the Committee on Reappointments, Promotions, and Tenure. It takes the first and most important step in the process, a recommendation to the, the dean, the provost, and the president. And faculty elsewhere at other institutions have authority over what um, gets published in prestige journals in one's discipline and act as referees for university presses. Notre Dame's Committee on Reappointments, Promotions, and Tenure would judge a biologist who espoused Lamarckism, as Lysenko did, to be a fraud or a bungler and would certainly refuse his tenure application. Such a theory simply doesn't square with 
the settled scientific consensus about evolution. The merit of a scientific contribution depends in part on its plausibility, its accuracy, its systematic importance, the intrinsic interest of the subject matter. And this version of evolution has been so often and so soundly rejected that it wouldn't even get a hearing now. And this kind of discipline of speech is not inconsistent with the marketplace metaphor. If cell reports or nature genetics declines to publish your article arguing for soft inheritance, that's the market at work. Sophisticated consumers of ideas just don't want to buy the idea. And if after six years of unsuccessful efforts to sell this, <laughs> the faculty <laughs> declines to award you tenure, that's not unlike mezzanine stage investors refusing to finance a failed venture. Free trade in ideas is not a guarantee of success. It's just a right to try. Some sellers go bust. But when we talk about regulation of faculty speech, we usually have in mind two other sources of authority. One is the administration, people like Dean Cole and me. Presidents and provosts and deans will sometimes act to control faculty speech, not because it doesn't meet the standards required for an award of tenure, but because they think it might harm the public image of the institution. Last year, Ilya Shapiro was suspended by Georgetown Law School, where he'd just been named executive director of the Center for the Constitution for criticizing President Biden's promise to nominate a black woman to replace Justice Breyer. Here's what Shapiro wrote or tweeted. Objectively best pick for Biden is Sri Srinivasan, who is solid progressive and very smart, even has identity politics benefit of being the first Asian Indian American, but of ass doesn't fit into latest intersectionality hierarchy, so we'll get a lesser black woman. The law school dean suspended Shapiro pending an investigation, and four months later, offered to reinstate him on a technicality, but he declined. My own experience with this sort of issue has convinced me that as a matter of prudence, it's best to let the issue pass without comment. Nowadays, when a faculty member right or left makes an unguarded remark about race or sex or ethnicity or gender identity, university administrators are inevitably asked by the other side to signal their condemnation or demand a retraction or, as in Shapiro's case, fire the offender. Nearly always, the aim of the demands is to restrict debate on the offensive issue, in other words, to close down the marketplace of ideas. I found that there's an additional important reason to refrain from censoring such inflammatory comments at Catholic universities. There is a cliche about religiously orthodox universities, Catholic ones in particular, that they can't be academically so ser serious because their orthodoxy is an obstacle to free thought. I mentioned earlier a 1988 subcommittee report on the AAUP's 1940 statement. That report spoke about universities like my own that have seminaries. Simply because it had a seminary, the subcommittee said, such an institution would labor under a cloud of suspicion that the teachings and writings of its faculty may not be truly free. I reject the AAUP's suggestion that religious orthodoxy is consistent with free thought. To take a parallel example, we would never say that scientific orthodoxy is inconsistent with free thought. But faculty tweets are really just a skirmish in a war whose decisive battles are fought over faculty hiring. And when a really good Catholic or other orthodox candidate is put forward, it would be unwise to give her opponents ammunition to say, no more Catholics, no more orthodox. They don't believe in academic freedom. The third source of authority, and the last point I want to touch on, that secular academics claim is inconsistent with the free market of ideas is, of course, the church. And it's not just secular academics. In July 1967, a graduate of my university, the Reverend Theodore Hesper, hosted a group of Catholic education uh, educators in Land Lakes, Wisconsin, to discuss the nature of the modern Catholic university. And the statement they produced began with this proclamation. To perform its teaching and research functions, the Catholic University must have a true autonomy and academic freedom in the face of authority of whatever kind, lay or clerical, external to the academic community. To say this is simply to assert that institutional autonomy and academic freedom are essential conditions of life and growth, and indeed of survival for Catholic universities as for all universities. 
The Land O'Lake Statement sets up an apparent conflict between academic freedom and church authority. The Catholic University must have academic freedom in the face of clerical authority. The squares with the view that the AAUP has held since its founding in 1915. Um, in that year, in a declaration of principles uh, that it published, the fledgling AUP stated that the first condition of progress in the discovery of truth is complete and unlimited freedom to pursue inquiry and publish its results. Schools committed to teaching the tenets of a particular faith, the AAUP concluded, do not, at least as regards one particular subject, accept the principles of freedom of inquiry. This creates another dilemma for Catholic universities. Lumen Gentium, uh, Vatican II's dogmatic constitution on the church says, bishops teaching in communion with the Roman pontiff are witnesses to divine and Catholic truth. In matters of faith and morals, they speak in the name of Christ. Ex Corde Ecclesiae applies this notion to higher education. Theologians, it says, should be faithful to the magisterium of the church as the authentic interpreter of sacred scripture and sacred tradition. Is this view of university life really inconsistent with academic freedom? I, uh, I think not. Indeed, to my way of thinking, it's the AUP's view that limits free inquiry. The 1915 Declaration <clears throat> will not countenance the pursuit of knowledge by any means other than the method endorsed by the dominant academic culture. Religious tradition, which I might point out is older than that culture, has its own theory of knowledge. According to that theory, truth is something we can't fully grasp through our own unaided reason. According to that theory, God reveals himself to us in the person of his son in scripture and in the tradition and teaching authority of the church. To be sure, it's a matter of faith whether this epistemology is right or wrong. But the same is true of the secular rationalism that the AUP would have us all embrace. How is the academic enterprise more free rather than less if we close off one path to understanding and force universities to confine their efforts to approved modes of inquiry? It's also a bit condescending for the AUP and the Land O'Lakes drafters to suppose that they alone have a care for academic freedom. John Paul II stresses in Ex Corde Ecclesiae that the church too recognizes the academic freedom of scholars. This is true, he says, in each discipline in accordance with its own principles and proper methods and within the confines of the truth and the common good. Aha, you might say, um, John Paul's is a more limited vision of freedom than the one proposed in the AUP's declaration. The AUP advocates complete and unlimited freedom. JP2 speaks of freedom in accordance with the discipline's principles and proper methods. But Ex Corte Ecclesiae actually speaks more carefully than the Declaration. Academics in every field are constrained by the nature of their material and governed by principles and paradigms laid down by the scholarly community. A botanist is not free to say that a lily has legs. A scholar of Chinese law is not free to say that in Beijing the internet is unregulated. A doctor cannot learn surgery by watching medical dramas on TV. Come to think of it, the AAUP limits the freedom of theologians to believe that the Holy Spirit plays an active role in the life of the church. If that were a permissible hypothesis, we would have to take a different view of church teaching authority. The Land O'Lake statement suggests that the AAUP can meddle in academic affairs and the church cannot because the church is an authority external to the academic community itself. This is certainly not how the church sees the matter. Ex Corte Ecclesia says, bishops should be seen not as external agents, but as participants in the life of the Catholic University. Whether the teaching office of the church is internal or external to the university really depends on the epistemological debate I alluded to earlier. We can't answer the question without taking a position on whether the church has something to contribute to our knowledge of God. I like to think that it does. Let me conclude with a final observation about how the bishops in fact participate in the life of Catholic universities and how we might square that with my earlier observations about the marketplace of ideas. Ex Corte Ecclesiae was written by a former university professor 
And it is, I think, both wise and modest in its account of the proper relation between the magisterium and the university. The same is true of the application of ex corde ecclesi written by the American bishops. They say, in essence, we bishops are not academics and scholars. It is not our business to tell you how a Catholic university should teach or write. The one thing we insist on is that you hire Catholics who love the church to do that work. Here is how the document puts the point. The responsibility for maintaining and strengthening the Catholic identity of the university rests primarily with the university itself. While this responsibility is entrusted principally to university authorities, including the Board of Trustees, it is shared in varying degrees by all members of the university community, and therefore calls for the recruitment of adequate university personnel, especially teachers and administrators, who are both willing and able to promote that identity. The identity of a Catholic university is essentially linked to the quality of its teachers and to respect for Catholic doctrine. Canon law, Canon 812, actually does require Catholic professors of theology to have a mandate from the local bishop acknowledging that they're teaching in communion with the church. But let me point out that this is an obligation um, incumbent upon the professor, not on the university. What the university does with that information is its business, but bishops don't try to enforce their uh, relations with, with professors through the university. So there you have it. I promised at the beginning that my conclusions were simple. If you want to build a great Catholic university, hire the right people who are in favor of that, and don't tell them what to say. So thank you. Got some time for a few questions, so the floor is yours. Or it's really his, but you, you can borrow it for a second, as long as you don't abuse the marketplace. <laughs> Sir. Yeah, you know, um, this is something that universities are giving a lot of thought to, and, and it actually has pluses and minuses. Uh, uh, the prevailing academic culture in the social sciences and languages and art and so on is, um, is left and progressive, and people who hold ideas at variance with that have a hard time finding outlets for what they're doing. And so to that extent, these electronic um, uh, media uh, are, are a benefit because anybody can can uh, publish anything. So I think um, in that way, uh, they increase trade in the marketplace of ideas. Um, I said there are pluses and minuses, and the minus is the same one that you see in, uh, in the political realm. Uh, one benefit to um, curated and edited publications, uh, like the you know, Cell Biology, the, one, the ones that I mentioned, or the, uh, the Yale Law Journal, uh, um, is that uh, somebody looks carefully at what should get published and what shouldn't and makes a decision about quality. Somebody does what the lawyers call site checking of the propositions to see if they're actually supported. Whereas on the internet, you can say anything. And so we have a lot more um, uh, lying or just stupidity on, on the internet that isn't uh, curated by editors. Um, the third thing in this, too, is a disadvantage. Um, it's not a disadvantage of the electronic um, outlets, but of the 
generation of readers of electronic outlets that we are raising, people don't have an appetite for reading longer pieces. Uh, in fact, some of these outlets like Twitter limit the number of characters you're allowed to use to express your idea, and that it's not conducive to sustained thought about important things. Um, universities are wrestling with this um, because there are some of these um, electronic outlets, I'm just familiar with the, uh, with what happens in law schools, are, are actually kind of new prestige journals. In fact, um, uh, they're more widely read than, um, than their print counterparts. And so uh, committees on reappointments, promotions, and tenure are um, beginning to deliberate about what weight they should give to publications in those, in those media, and they haven't decided that. You know, they're, they're all over the place on that. Yes? What do you think it will take for a university to sort of all have the university to like become fully compliant with uh, what's part of the student book? I don't think uh, I don't think that's something that we're gonna settle in our lifetime. I I um, I I have um, by virtue of what I've done for the last twenty five years, um a, a good acquaintance with most of the Catholic universities in the United States and many of them around the world. Um, I, I'm going the uh, week after next to uh, serve on a Vatican agency that does evaluation of ecclesiastical universities and faculties around the world. So um, it's a subject that I can speak with some authority about. Um, there is an immense variety of charisms and views among Catholic universities um, and uh, there is no authority, including the Dicastery for Education and Culture, as it's called within the Vatican, that's going to enforce a kind of um, similarity of views among all of these. Um, I, I think that, a, that uh, a fair degree of, of liberty yeah, in working out the view about uh, Catholic universities is probably a helpful thing uh, in the same way as um, one of the faculty we hired here in, in my time uh, was a Dominican who later went on to be the president of the Dominican House in Washington, uh, Father Reggie Witt. And Reggie used to say that if Methodists had remained within the church, they'd be in order. Not a, uh, the Catholic Church is that big, and there is that much room for it. Um, I, I do hope that there will be, I, I think that there has been since ex corde ecclesia and the application of ex corde ecclesia. More serious attention to the fact that we really are trying to do something different and we really mean it. Um, uh, I, I think the Notre Dame Law School is the, I, I, I just love this law school and I think it is one of the most serious, interesting, vibrant, intellectually alive places. And, um, you know, I think it's grown that way in the last in the last quarter century due to the people that it's, that it's hired. But it's a different view from what you're going to see at, uh, at the Yale Law School, say, and I, I think that's a good thing. It's also a different thing from what you'll see at Boston College, which, uh, to my regret, is not as serious about its Catholic uh, undertakings. As, but there's going to be a lot of variety, and um, I don't know. That's your all's job. I was going to say, because uh, your magnificence, you ended with those nice words for Notre Dame, and we're all going to say thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mom.